Okay, welcome back to class, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to start chapter 4, and the topic for the chapter 4 today is Rational Choice Theory. Development of Rational Choice Theory. We're going to look at classical criminology as one of the roots of Rational Choice Theory developed by Cesare Baccaria. And then we're also going to talk about James Q. Wilson. Here we're going to deal more in contemporary version of classical theory based on intelligent thought processes and criminal decision making. Let's evaluate the risk of crime. What makes people commit crime? Crime is avoided when the risk outweighs the reward. In other words, when you know if you commit a crime, either to steal a loaf of bread at Walmart, for example, and you're going to be going to prison for stealing a loaf of bread. So in other words, is the risk of stealing a loaf of bread worth going to jail for six months? And then we're also going to look at offense-specific crime. And then we're also going to look at offender-specific crime. Under structuring criminality, we have peers and guardianship, need for examining and trials, economic need opportunity, personal traits and experience. Structuring crime, choosing the place of a crime when the when criminal is trying to commit a crime, part of what they look for is where they're going to commit a burglary, for, for example. In other words, they choose the place and then they also focus on a particular target. And then they might write up their own script as to how they're going to do what they need to do. Imagine, for example, you are a burglar. What script will you follow to avoid detention? I would say maybe you creep in under the door or you creep in through a window. How might the police use the fact that offenders follow certain scripts as a way of preventing crime or catching criminal? And what the police can do is have what I would call right now a good community relation with the people of the neighborhood where they could let people be aware of what that particular criminal or burglar has been doing to enter people's house so people can be aware of their surroundings and what is going on. Is crime truly rational? That's the question. It is easy to illustrate that crimes are product of rational, objective thought when they involve ongoing criminal conspiracy for economic gain. Is drug use rational? I mean, most people choose to do it. And some of us don't do it because it's not a good thing. Is violence rational? Is hate crime rational? That's the question. Also, is sex crime rational, such as rape, child abuse, or molestation? We all have what is called a natural restraint against crime. Because the reason why I said that is nobody's putting a gun to our head to commit a crime. We choose to do that on our own. And then we also talk about self-interest and social concern. We're going to talk about situational crime prevention. Here we seek to reduce immediate and particular criminal opportunities. In other words, we try to make sure we don't create the opportunity for somebody to commit a crime against us or break into our place. Criminal acts can be prevented if potential targets are carefully guarded. In other words, let's say a burglar is trying to break into a house. What does he need to do? He will look around to see if there are cameras out there, which is other, otherwise known as CCTV camera, or maybe the house have a, bug, a, a burglar alarm or a, bug, a burglar bar attached to the door or to the windows. The means to commit crimes are controlled 
Potential offenders are carefully monitored through those systems that I just discussed. And then we also have what is called a defensive, a defensible space. Here, as an owner of a house, you defend your space. What do you what do we do by defending our space? Some of us keep guns and other kinds of weapons in the house to defend our space. And then we're also going to look at the craved model. What are the crime prevention strategies? We need to increase the effort needed to commit crime, increase the risk of committing crime, reduce rewards of crime, induce guilt, also increase shame, reduce provocation, and remove all the excuses that will make somebody wants to commit a crime against us. Evaluating situational crime prevention again, we have under there, we have what is called a healing benefit. Def, we're going to talk about diffusion and discouragement. What are the healing costs? It has to do with displacement, extinction, and whatever you lost when people burglarized your place or stole from you, then you have to replace it. Let's talk about general deterrence of crime. Fear of criminal penalties will convince a potential law violator that the pains of crime outweigh its benefit. Yes, that's a general deterrence. When somebody knows if they committed a rape or an assault on somebody and they might be going to prison for like five, seven years, would they want to commit the crime? I don't think they will. Perception and deterrence. The actual chance and the perception that punishment will be forthcoming influence criminality. If you know you're going to be penalized for an offense or a crime, then you may want to think twice before committing a crime. Some individuals and classes of offenders are more deterrable than others. It's true, you know. That's why we have what is called recidivism. In other words, reoffending and going back to prison all the time. Some of these guys don't care whether they've been to prison three or four times. They would rather go back anyway. So you see, I mean, so they are not deterred by any means from committing crime, even when they just came out of prison. Now we're going to look at marginal and restrictive deterrence. Marginal deterrence refers to relative effectiveness of punishment. In other words, how effective is the punishment is. Then we look at restrictive deterrence, which is more of what we could call partial deterrence, refers to situations in which the threat of punishment can reduce but not eliminate the frequency severity and the duration of crime. In other words, the punishment will only serve as, an, as a little deterrent. That's what I would call it. So it doesn't eliminate the frequency that people commit that particular crime or the severity. Punishment and deterrent. Certainty of punishment Research shows a direct relationship between crime rates and certainty of punishment. Police and certainty of punishment. Severity of punishment certain, refers certainty rather than severity is key to deterring criminal behaviors. Swiftness of punishment. In other words, apply how rapidly and closely do we apply punishment to that individual when they commit a crime? Now let's evaluate general deterrence. Under there, we look at rationality, system effectiveness. In other words, how the court system works quickly to adjudicate the cases. Criminal discount punishment, some offenders 
and some crimes are more deterrable than others. Under specific deterrence, again, the view that criminal sanctions should be so powerful that offenders will never repeat their criminal acts. An example of that would be the death penalty. I mean, we have, if you kill somebody, that's a good chance that you will get the death penalty. Does that stop people from killing one another? No. But it does reduce the amount of time those kind of crimes have been committed. Longer incarceration may delay recidivism, but we're talking about sending people away for like 8, 10, 15 years. Sure, it does reduce the rate of reoffending again, which is what recidivism is all about. Somebody that's been in prison for like 15 years, when they come out, they will have to think twice before trying to commit the offense because they know that the system may be hard on them and send them away for like maybe another 20 years. Harshest treatment may increase rather than reduce crime. Punishment may breed defiance rather than deterrence. The stigma of harsh punishment labels people. When we, when we talk about them in particular, you look at somebody that uh, been to prison for like 15 years and come back to the neighborhood. People tend to label them, you know, like, them. oh, for example, they might say, oh, John Q, oh, that guy over there, oh yeah, he just came back from the big house, you know, or he just came back from the joint. Ashes punishment may case psychological problem, may create psychological problems. Effect is negligible in neighborhoods where almost everyone has criminal record. It's true. Because when you live in a particular neighborhood where almost everybody has been to jail or prison, the threat of punishment is negligible to them. They really don't care about it. They, you know, that's why they, they still continue to commit crime. Now, let's look at incapacitation effect. The idea that keeping offenders in confinement will eliminate the risk of their committing further offenses. More than one in every hundred adults is behind bars. That's a lot. There have been periods of time when increases in incarceration rates increased while overall crime was decreasing. True. Other time, crime rate increases coincide, coinciding with increasing incarceration rate. Now, Let's look at the policy implications of choice theory. Rational choice theory, what are the major premise? Law violate is a form of law violating behavior occurs after offenders weigh information on their personal needs and the institutional factors involved in the difficulty and risk of committing a crime. What are the strengths of rational theory? It explains why Irish people do not constantly engage in crime. Relates theory to crime control policy. It is not limited by class or other social variables. Variables. Research also focuses on offense patterns, where, when, and how crime takes place. Now let's look at the implications of the general deterrence. It says people will commit crime if they perceive that the benefit outweighs the risk. Crime is a function of war of severity, certainty, and the speed of punishment. The strength shows the relationship between crime and punishment, suggests a real solution to crime. The research focused on the perception of punishment, effect of legal sanctions, probability of punishment and crime rate. Specific deterrence, policy implication. The major premise, if punishment is severe enough, criminals 
will not repeat their illegal acts, provides a strategy to reduce crime, that's a strain of it, and the research focus on recidivism, repeat offending, punishment type, and crimes. Now let's look at the policy implications of incapacitation. The major premise of that is keep, keeping non-criminals out of circulation will reduce crime rate. The strength, it recognizes the role that opportunity plays in criminal behavior. Provides a solution to chronic offending. Prison population and crime rate, sentence length and crime. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of chapter 